Uh, my name is Khalil. Uh, now I would like to welcome Mr. Obafemi Michael Aminashwan from the NJMS Rutgers Biomedical Health Science School of Graduate Studies. He will be presenting the epidemiology of concussions in men's elite rugby sevens and rugby 15s. Obafemi, would you like to share your screen with us now? Hello everyone, thank you. My apologies, the screen sharing wasn't allowed. You can let us know if you aren't able to share your screen for any reason, but it should be enabled. It seems that he may have lost connection, so he is rejoining the meeting and we should have his presentation started in a moment. Hello, sorry. This is the right thing. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, good evening, my name is Obafemi Michael Animashang and today I'll be presenting a paper in Fuller, Taylor and Raftery uh, focused on the epidemiology of concussion in men's elite rugby sevens and 15. Um, the, journal, the article can be found in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, March 2014 edition. So the focus of the study is to was to address the clinical need of concussions and the return of play um, in professional rugby sevens and fifteens. Um, there currently isn't a protocol for return of play for patients, um, players who are injured through um, concussion during play or tournament play or treatment. So Fuller and, the, and their research team developed this, art, developed this article and research to determine the incidence, nature, and causation of concussion for elite players. Um, this is a cohort study that was done between August 2017 and 2013 within three leagues and tournaments, the English Premiership, the International Rugby Board, Rugby 15s, and 7s tournaments. Uh, within the, the study, the data was collected through team physicians who, who recorded the concussion details, the risk factors, the position of the player, um, the severity of the concussion, which was graded by the amount of time absent from play, 
as well as other um, biological like factors such as height, weight, age. The match exposures were calculated separately from between the sevens and 15 matches, given the fact that sevens has a shorter amount, of, has a shorter clock on the game matches and 15s is a longer match between the, between the two um, forms of rugby. Through, through their data analysis, they found that rugby sevens has a longer incident exposure and incidence rate uh, with a 8.3 for every 1,000, every 1,000 players, uh, while 15s has a exposure rate of 4.5 per 1,000, meaning for every 1,000 players, 4.5 of them are going to have concussions in 15, or 8.3 have concussions in sevens. And through their research, they also found that there were more, the severity was increased in sevens. Um, and that the return rate to play is also was also um, extended. As you can see in this graph below, the black line is rugby 15s, while the dotted line is rugby sevens. The from the initial date, day zero, where they're injured from their concussion, rugby 15 players, 72% of rugby 15 players return to play within 10 days, but only 38% of rugby seven players return in 10 days. So that shows the severity of their concussions, um, their initial concussions. There was also um, a significance in how, how, they, how um, their, the players recorded their injuries. Most of the player recorded injuries were within the second half of their tournament. So a part, part of these tournaments are paired where one like the the first half would be um, within the same week of the second half, while other tournaments they have the opportunity of waiting a, a month or two between their next uh, the next portion of their tournament. So that uh, extreme turnaround also assists with the 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 impact of their injuries. The main the new findings of this paper show that there is a benchmark for incidence and severity for rugby concussions, as well as that rugby sevens has a higher incidence and severity when it comes to concussions. It also identifies um, areas of investigation to reduce concussions within rugby play, which include the awareness of referees, um, awareness of team physicians, and also um, addressing a tackle uh, tackle technique. This paper also applies to the clinical implication, which was the original purpose of reducing um, concussion uh, return to play, as well as developing a protocol for return to play. Um, and a main part of that would be for physicians to be more vigilant, vigilant in removing players within the tournament who do show signs of concussions, as well as uh, developing a a full recovery plan of return to play. So there's a, a standardized time scale depending on the severity of the concussion. So there, I would just like to end with this note that there's multiple ways of getting concussions within the sport and that the, the paper itself, a critique of mine is that there, I would like to have seen that there were treatments in involved to see how those aligned with their return to play, as well as alternative um, methods of how players um, receive their concussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Obafemi. Would anyone like to ask a question? I just want to make a, com a comment and uh, again, uh, great job there, uh, Obafemi. Um, this paper is just a phenomenal paper in which they looked at the concussion rates across events as well as across um, seasons or the playing schedule. 
the unique thing is, is that um, the one factor that they could not, uh, and again, I think, um, you know, in the paper, they, they commented the um, higher incidence in the second tournaments may result from cumulative play and fatigue um, within a 10 day period. But the, what they could not decipher was that there was no uh, significant finding between concussions and halves. But the thing is, what you can find out is that, you know, they did allude to the fact of fatigue, but it's hard to uh, adjust for that, though, to really, really evaluate that over a season or multiple fixtures when they have um, varying times between fixtures. Great job. Thank you again, Obafemi. Next, we have we will have Mr. Owen Kachinad of Stuyvesant High School presenting a paper titled "The Risk Factors for Head Injury Events in Professional Rugby Union: A Video Analysis of 464 Head Injury Events to Perform Proposed Injury Prevention Strategies." Owen, would you like to share your screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Does this look good to everyone? Okay. Hi, my name is Owen Kuchinad, and as of this Friday, I will be a rising senior at Stuyvesant High School in New York City. I'm presenting a paper titled Risk Factors for Head Injury Events in Professional Rugby Union, a video analysis of 464 head injury events to inform proposed injury prevention strategies. This was published by the British Journal of Sports Medicine and the University of Bath. The tackle is the most injurious match event in rugby union. Between 40 and 60% of all injuries can be attributed to the tackle. Among the more common of these tackle injuries are those to the head, with the concussion being a major injury issue. Um, for the purpose of this study, a tackle was defined as any event where one or more players attempt to stop or impede the ball carrier. This is distinguished from other definitions of a tackle in which the ball carrier must be thrown to the ground. Or, result in the ground. The head injury assessment HIA protocol is a three-stage process to assist with identification, diagnosis, and management of head impact events. This was used in this study and is, and is used to diagnose players in, um, after they've possibly received head injuries in professional rugby. Um, the three stages involve an in-game assessment, a post-game assessment, and a uh, later assessment that um, occurs between 36 and 40 hours after the injury took place. So the objective of the study was to identify the characteristics of tackles that expose players to the highest risk of head injury, and then to provide possible interventions on how to stop these type of tackles from being so prevalent in the sport. And so the study was conducted between 2013 and 2015 in major professional elite rugby union competitions. They analyzed 3,624 3, tackles from 1,516 matches, which 464 of this resulted in the head injury assessment, as in there was some uh, indication of head injury, and so an assessment was made, and the, all these tackles were videotaped. Now, they were analyzed for tackle type, direction, speed, acceleration, and body position of the tackler. Um, the analysis of the, of the tackle characteristics were provided by professional rugby coach referees, experienced rugby epidemiology researchers, and they watched all 3,624 of these tackles. Now they characterize the tackle types, tackle directions, and such on in table one, and you can see that like the three um, most prevalent of tackle types are active shoulder tackles, passive shoulder tackles, smaller tackles. They account for up to 99% of in-game tackles. And they have, they've created a figure with all the definitions, uh, the results. Propensity to cause an head injury assessment was significantly greater for active shoulder tackles, front on tackles, accelerating tackles, high speed tackles, head to head contact tackles, and upright tackles. So in table two, this is where they um, conducted research on tackle type, direction, and the acceleration of the player, in which they found that active shoulder tackles had high significantly higher HIA event propensity and passive shoulder and smother tackles. Front on tackles had significantly higher propensity and incident rate than those tackles at an angle side or from behind the player. 
And when I say higher incident, incidents for an HIA, this is an HIA to the tackler themselves, not to the player that is being tackled. And then lastly, when the tackler is accelerating into the tackle, as in they're like they're accelerating into the player that is being tackled, the tackler is at a greater risk for an HIA than if the player is accelerating into the tackle and the tackle is at a stack, the tackler is at a stack position. So here we can see that the high the tackler when it is at a high speed is much more at risk than when the player, it's the ball carrier itself is coming at it at a high speed. And also when there's head to head contact or the tackles being made from an upright position, there it results in greater head injury assessments being made. And that is because head to head contact obviously would result in um, more head injuries. Now, the upright tackles and tacklers above the shoulder are more likely to result in head-to-head -head contact. A lot of these, um, the characteristics that were discussed in the results, result in more head-to-head -head contact themselves, which would obviously in turn create more head injuries. And then also the high speeds, increasing acceleration in front tackles and active shoulder tackles all contribute to high impact force done by the tackler onto the ball carrier. Now this would obviously um, in turn create this high impact force would create a greater risk for head injury if the head is being hit with, is hitting something at a higher speed, acceleration, or just more force. Now, something interesting is that previous studies have shown that front on tackles were actually least responsible for injury, which is the only uh, contradiction with other previous studies that was made in this, uh, um, this own research paper. And the inclination is that the previous studies only um, researched injury in general and not head injury themselves. So there may be a greater correlation between front on tackles and head injury as opposed to front on tackles and general injury. Okay, so going on to interventions based on the data that was collected, um, laws can be enforced and written to lower the height of tackles and change the tackler body position from upright to bent at the waist. So these would re this would result in tackles made at lower levels relative to the height of the ball carrier, which would result in less head-to-head -head contact in which obviously two heads are being hit with one another, great force. And then another proposed um, intervention has been a change in the offside line, which would um, bring players close together at lower speed. However, the article suggests that this may also increase the number of situations that tackler needs to accelerate into a tackle which would in turn actually hurt the tackler's ability to stay, stay safe. So this article is not supportive of this possible change because the, when the tackler accelerates into a tackle, into the ball carrier, it's been proven that this results in more head injury assessments and in turn more head injuries. So this change would not be beneficial, but it's good to know that based on studies like these, we can kind of search for more interventions that would possibly re result in less head head injury assessments overall. These are my, this is my reference. And I thank everyone for listening and hear me out. And I'd like to feel any, the time for like questions. Thank you, Owen, for your presentation. Um, now we'll open the field for questions if anyone has any. Well, I'll just bring up two points, obviously a paper. There's another very good paper done by World Rugby. Um, they brought a lot of the uh, big names out from uh, South Africa all the way up uh, to England, uh, from New Zealand as well. Uh, the importance, I think, um, when you're looking at the, um, uh, and I think Owen brought it up, uh, they stated the head on or the front tackles were less injurious, you're saying? I'm saying that this study showed that they were more injurious for head tackles, but previous studies have shown that they were less, the least likely to cause injury, but general injury, not specifically head injury. Right. Um, well, again, um, from the earlier studies till now, uh, you know, um, I think um, they're just looking at it in more detail. So it, it was probably harder for them to quantify what they're doing now. Now, when you move to the video analysis, they, you have that data right in front of you. It gives you the actual picture of the mechanism. And that's exactly what we attempted to do with some of our work, 
looking at the mechanisms of injuries and that. And that's a unique aspect of with regard to what we're talking about here. Um, I do want to say that I believe they, after this paper came out, they attempted to do the law changes at the university championships level. Um, but again, I think they had to abandon it due to the fact that um, um, I, I, I can't really say for certain that players were injuring themselves more, but I do want to say that they weren't able to um, employ an attempt at a new tackling method after you've been trained for so many years. So basically just imagine uh, we uh, go to the national club championships and then tell everyone that you have to tackle below the shoulder, you know, uh, or below the nipple line. What happens is that that awkward um, new introduction of a new law also comes with problems itself. Uh, implementation, uh, team adherence, player adherence, coaching adherence. So there's a lot of factors that probably went wrong with them attempting to do that. And um, again, that just shows you um, science uh, is not wrong, but implementing Injury prevention is always a challenge. And I think that's something that we could all agree upon here. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to implement, we take the data, we look at it, and we try to suggest our best uh, ideas for injury prevention and try to implement them. And how do we implement them? So that's really the biggest problem, I think, uh, with any research and um, particularly with mechanisms on that. And uh, again, I think all of you can understand what I'm saying here. But again, uh, great job, Owen. Uh, very good presentation. Well, this concludes week two of our summer lecture series 2021. I wanted to thank everyone on our Zoom meeting for coming and also thank our conference call attendees. Uh, thank you everyone so much.